The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 4581 in the name of John Finney on ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers in the Crummerty and Murray Firths. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press, the, pre, sorry, be press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on John Finney to open the debate around seven minutes, please, Mr Finney. Thank you very much indeed, President Officer. I can also uh, thank colleagues for, for signing the motion, particularly my friend and colleague Claudia Beamish, whose signature ensured that the motion enjoyed cross-party support. Um, the motion talks about congratulating Cromarty Rising. A Mem number of members are in, in the gallery tonight. They're an outstanding community organisation, as evidenced by their uh, opposition to the ship-to-ship -ship transfer of oil in the Murray Firth. And to my mind, that's real politics. It's politics that's generated over 100,000 signatures on a, a petition, a, sig a petition to the Secretary of State at UK level. Um, and of course, they've garnered the support of 27 community councils. So almost, number of people involved in it. I'd like to mention my immediate colleagues, Anne Thomas and James McKissick Leach, who have been clearly um, uh, active in this. And it, there has been significant interest being uh, prompted by this. The matter is now live at the Petitions Committee. And I'd also like to thank all those who sent briefings. Lots and lots of information, some of it highly technical, and I'm not a technical person, so I'll just give you two very small bits. Two tonnes per second pumped between the ships. So therefore, any assessment that's based on a one tonne spill is not credible as a maximum spill volume to determine impacts anywhere, least of all in a special area of conservation. Um, the application uh, that we're talking about came from the uh, Cromarty Firth Port Authority. It's a trust port. There's some, uh, I, I, well, I certainly own the, the, the statement. I can't uh, fully understand the roles and responsibilities of a trust port. I've posed a number of um, questions to, to the government about this. But what we do know is they must have regard to the National Marine Plan and they must also consult and they, they were responsible for consulting beyond the immediate confines of the, the, the Cromarty Firth there into the Murray Firth because the proposal related to the uh, open sea and they failed. They failed spectacularly. Um, 2070 community, 27 community councils are opposed and there was next to no engagement from the Cromarty Firth Port Authority. Um, now, I think it's fair to say, and the, the motion does say, that ship-to-ship -ship transfer of oil has taken place within the confines of the Cromarty Firth for decades, and the motion makes it clear that there's no opposition to that. That's in the relative safety of a port tied to a quay with all the well-documented backup. Um, and this is a rescheduled debate. I have to say, the day before the last debate, uh, I got an email from the port of Cromarty Firth saying, and I quote, the port is working with NIG's owners to bring the terminal back into operation. Now, that's very good news and hopefully it obviates the need for them to pursue uh, the transfer at sea. So it's important to say there is no live application at the moment. The previous application was returned undetermined last summer. But the proposal was that it take place in the open seas of the Murray Firth. And that's an EU Natura um, 2000 special area of conservation for bottlenose dolphin and the proposed Murray Firth special protection area for a wide range of seabirds. And roles and responsibilities are very important. This is not a party political issue, indeed it would be very unfortunate it ever became such, but the Minister will understand that certainly my immediate colleague here share the wish to have all decision making in regard to this taking place within Scotland. But it is at the moment a decision for the Maritime Coast Guard Agency. It's a UK body. Uh, the SNH is the only statutory consultee and clearly there's a role for Marine Scotland. Um, uh, these are Scottish bodies and clearly there's a role for the Scottish Government. Now, ministers have repeatedly claimed the Scottish Government was not formally invited to comment. The Cromley Firth Port uh, Authority's agents sent Marine Scotland and others a copy of the application and a letter explaining how and by when to make representation to the MCA. Now, the press line subsequently used by the Scottish Government was, and I quote, the Scottish Government was not aware of being directly approached by the UK Government during the consultation. That's misleading and disingenuous, uh, Minister. Uh, the words appear to have been deliberately chosen so that the statement could be defended as literally and strictly correct. And given that the, the Marine Scotland was not directly approached by the MC, rather by the Cromarty Firth Port uh, Authority agents and by a letter of formal consultation by the, the Harbour Master, the Scottish Government could and should have brought serious environmental and non-environmental risks to the attention of the MCA. Now, the Scottish Government has, must obviously act responsibility within the existing framework and uh, maritime matters, of course, have a wider obligation. We have to be good neighbours. In relation to this proposal, uh, I asked in May of last year the, the Cabinet Secretary uh, 
uh, to ask the Scottish Government what assessment of risk to the marine life, including orcas, it has made of the proposed ship-to-ship -ship transfers in the Murray Firth. Now, that was answered by the Cabinet Secretary, who said the Scottish Government has no functions in relation to the ship-to-ship -ship tra uh, oil transfer licences. This is a matter reserved to the UK Government, and we will continue to progress uh, for devolution of these powers to Scotland. And that, most certainly, Minister, is an answer, but it's not an answer to the question posed, and that's disappointing. They're nothing to do with us. Um, it's no way to deal with an important issue like this. Thousands of people in Scotland, indeed, um, Thousands uh, around the world made their views known to the UK government and they weren't contacted by the UK government. So um, we know, the campaigners know, we know the Scottish government agency was con contacted. Um, and um, environment is a devolved matter and perhaps the, 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 the minister can outline the responsibilities he believes the government should take in relation to this. I received an email that said, and I quote, the ongoing ping pong between Scottish ministers and the Secretary of State around the devolved and reserved parameters of this issue detracts from the underlying obligation under the European Habitats Directive. The Scottish and UK government should act to prevent such risk activity in such a sensitive location by ensuring proper implementation of the Habitats Directive. That's a, a view I, I share. But I have to say, I do welcome an apparent change of tone where the First Minister fairly recently said that she was unconvinced, quote, by the safety of ship-to-ship -ship oil transfer in the Murray Firth. Minister, you'll know we've been here before, um, and, and did, uh, this was in 2007 with Transfers in the Fourth, and my colleague Mark Ruskell will talk about that. And um, at that time, um, one of your predecessors in office said, even a scintilla of environmental risk is unacceptable. And that's the position I hope you would adopt now. This proposal will create no new jobs. It put at risk the marine life of world significance and most important industry, the tourism industry. And the Murray Coast, uh, that brings in income of 108 million per annum, employing 2,600 people, one in 10 of the population. And as a comparator, perhaps people will reflect in the name that will, they'll know, the Brayer disaster in Shetland, where six years um, took to recover from that. There is a comparator I would like to, to, to put to you, Minister, and that is the situation where energy as a reserve matter, but everyone knows there will be no nuclear power stations in Scotland because the Scottish Government will utilise the powers it has under the planning legislation to ensure that they don't go ahead. And that's the approach I would encourage you to take. Um, in the short time there is for the debate, I'll maybe move to some final points. Thank you, President Officer. I, I hope, Minister, you'll take the opportunity to, to respond to the various issues that I've raised on behalf of constituents. Day-to-day -day operations involving transferring crude oil between ships at anchor at this location are highly likely to cause disturbance to bottlenose, dolphin and other European protected species, EPS. That would equate to an offence under the Conservation Natural Habitats Regulations 1994. That would require any transfer operation to be undertaken legally would require a licence under Regulation 44 of those regulations, an EPS licence. Scottish ministers in the shape of Marine Scotland are the body that would issue that licence. And it's evident that tests for that licence can't be met without breaching the EU Habitats Directive. I respectfully ask, Minister, that you regain the vigour that the Scottish Government had in 2007 when the fourth was at threat. You have the power to stop this now. Please use the existing power over the environment to evidence and resist any threat to our precious Murray Firth, marine and wildlife our coastal communities, and the thousands of jobs that depend on it. Please confirm an EPS licence won't be issued and thereby stop ship-to-ship -ship transfers happening in the Murray Firth. Our marine life and our coastal communities deserve no less. Thank you. We now move to the open speeches. And can I remind all members that during debates, even members' debates, they should always speak through the chair and not directly to each other. And I call Marie Todd uh, to be followed by Edward Mountain. Thank, thank you, Presiding Officer. Firstly, I'd like to apologise to the Chamber. I have another engagement this evening, so I'll not be able to stay and hear the contributions in what I'm sure will be an excellent debate. I want to start by thanking my colleague John Finney um, for securing this debate on ship to ship transfers, a subject which is of such interest to so many of our constituents in the Highlands and Islands. All of us, I'm sure, have been contacted by constituents from throughout the region. Communities are concerned about this proposal all the way up the east coast from Murray up to Tain and all parts in between, like Nairn, Inverness, the Black Isle and Invergordon. 
The potential environmental impact of this venture presents serious concerns and it's at the heart of my constituents' worries about ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers. If this marine environment is damaged as a result of ship-to-ship -ship oil transfer, local fishing will be harmed and the knock-on effect on tourism in the whole area could be disastrous. And these factors really must be taken into account. On this occasion, the environmentalists are joined in their concerns by many people living and working in the communities on this coast. The case against this application has been made by organisations like Cromarty Rising and local councillors like Craig Fraser and Liz MacDonald. And I can't be the only politician in the chamber to have received many hundreds of emails and indeed personal visits from Craig Fraser. He's done an excellent job in taking this campaign forward on the Black Isle and in the wider area. And with support from members of the local communities, I would like to praise them all for their work on this issue. With regards to the environmental risks, I will acknowledge that the chances of something going wrong are small and that generally speaking, these ship-to-ship -ship transfers are a relatively safe process. The issue here is that if something were to go wrong in this particular marine ecosystem, the consequences would be catastrophic. And what many of us can't understand is why ship-to-ship -ship transfer at sea is being proposed at all. Ship-to-ship -ship transfer already happens in this area. It happens already at NIG with the ships tied up at shore. The risks are undoubtedly greater at sea. So why are the communities being asked to take these risks? What are the benefits? These firsts are already industrialised, which brings millions of pounds to the local economy and supports jobs. Those are things that we really need in the Highlands and Islands. There is little opposition to industrial activity in general in this area. But what we all agree is that sustainable development with the contribution of all stakeholders where marine ecosystems are managed for the benefit of all is something we need to work towards. This is an issue that people care passionately about. I can see that when I speak to people in the Highlands and Islands about this and the people who have made the long journey down to Edinburgh today to listen to this debate and to demonstrate their opposition to ship to ship transfers at this parliament. Unfortunately, though, none of us here in this chamber have the power to resolve this matter because it's a reserved issue. Only the UK government can do that, and so far their response to this has been extremely disappointing. The process of resolving this issue has taken far too long, and as has been mentioned, the Scottish government doesn't even need to be consulted on this discussion decision despite having responsibility for environmental issues. I'm, I'm sorry, we've no time, Mr Finney. Many of us in the Highlands and Islands believe that the UK government doesn't understand the needs of local communities. I support calls to, to devolve the powers over this area. I'm glad that the Scottish Government will press the UK Government on this. I hope that these powers are devolved swiftly to make sure that local voices are heard and responded to and that the transparency which we pride ourselves of in this chamber, in this parliament, can be brought to this matter. Thank you. I call Edwin Mountain to be followed by Angus MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to throw members to my register of interest. I'd also like to thank John Finney for bringing this debate and allowing us to discuss it. Before we look at the specific petition, I'd like to point out that oil transfers have been taking place in the Cromarty Firth safely for over 30 years. The, these transfers have been undertaken using the jetty at NIG. This petition relates to a different proposal, which was subsequently withdrawn. The petition is based on a Cromarty Port Authority application for ship-to-ship -ship transfers in an area of the Murray Firth, which they had jurisdiction. After reading John Finney's motion, I'm concerned that the member has reached a conclusion regarding ship-to-ship -ship transfers in the, K in, the, sorry, in the Cromarty Firth Port Authority area without sight of an actual proposal. I'd like to remind this Parliament that there is no current proposal, and nor is there much chance there will be one before October 2017 at the earliest, and that is not a given. Now, with my background in land and fisheries management, I always look at proposals with a careful eye, and my natural reaction, surprisingly, is to be conservative. With this in mind, I would always adopt the precautionary principle in relation to matters that may affect the environment. Thus, when it comes to looking at ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers, 
my default position is to question the need for them. I also automatically look for evidence to any positive, oh, sorry, any potential negatives. My research has indicated that there are regular ship-to-ship -ship transfers in Shetland, and indeed there were a significant amount of transfers at NIG. But this has and continues to take place when ships are anchored to jetties. I have therefore to ask if it is the secure berth that reduces the risks. I did look for evidence to support the claim that oil spills were a real danger. But my research indicated that in the last 10 years, oil spills from ship to ship transfers are rare. I looked around the whole of the UK, and it seems transfers are quite common in some areas. But it seems that in the last 10 years, there have only been three recorded spills. This, uh, Mr. Finney, I'm sorry, I'm so short of time. Uh, uh, if, you, if you'd like me to, uh, if I've got time towards the end, I'll see if I can bring you in. This would suggest that ship to ship oil transfers are relatively safe. Indeed, I'd like to point out one fact that I think we should all remember, and that is in relation to the fourth replacement crossing. As constructed, it gives me huge concerns. If there is a spill on the oil on the bridge, it would all enter the Firth as drainages from the bridge is unfiltered and directly, and directly discharged into the Firth. But let me be clear, I do understand there will always be risk, and it's right that we consider and see whether these risks are acceptable or unacceptable. Now, I'm also told that there are other regulations in place to help prevent oil spillage from taking place. For example, the 2010 shipping regulations were introduced to ensure ship to ship oil transfer were conducted safely. These regulations gained support from a number of organisations such as the WWF, RSP Scotland, Well and Dolphin Conservation, to name but a few. Looking specifically at the application, I would remind Parliament that in January 2017, the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency asked the Cromarty Firth Port Authority to withdraw and resubmit their application. The reason the Port Authority was asked to resubmit was because of a lack of evidence on volatile organic compounds and their potential impact on ecosystems, a reasonable and good decision based on the precautionary principle. I understand that since that date there has been a legal challenge to the existing consent for ship-to-ship -ship transfers at NIG. I also understand that this has been successfully uh, defended by the Ma Maritime Coast Guard Agency. If the Cromarty Firth, our uh, Port Authority, are to submit a new application, I ask that they listen to the local community councils, Cromarty Rising, RSPB, Dolphin Watch, to hear their concerns and make sure that they address them. And if they can't address them, then they should not resubmit that application. To conclude, Presiding Officer, when it comes to ship ship transfers, I do not feel we have heard sufficient evidence. I believe that we as MSPs need to wait to hear evidence once a further consultation has taken place. And then perhaps we can revisit this debate. But having said that, let me be clear. The lack of information at the moment means that I find ship-to-ship -ship transfers in the, Mor in the Murray Firth a difficult uh, proposition to support and not one that I can do. Thank you. Call Angus MacDonald, who followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you, uh, President Officer. I'm pleased to be contributing to this debate today, although you may be wondering why an MSP representing Falkirk East is taking part in a debate on an issue 200 miles away. Well, I've actually got some form on this issue. Back in 2006-07, as a councillor representing Grangemouth on Falkirk Council, I, along with others, successfully campaigned to force Forth Ports to reconsider their plans for ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers on the 1st of 4th. At the time, our SNP-led administration at Falkirk was also opposed, and it became an issue in the 2007 Holyrood election campaign uh, when Annabel Ewing, incidentally, was our candidate. Uh, thankfully, in the face of significant opposition, uh, Fourth Port saw sense and withdrew their application. I also have an interest in the issue as Deputy Convener of the Petitions Committee, where we have a live petition against the current Murray Firth proposal, which has been submitted by Greg Fullerton on behalf of Cromarty Rising. So I appreciate the opportunity to contribute to this debate and thank John Finney for ensuring it came to the Chamber for discussion. So as I referred to uh, a minute or so ago, um, this issue of ship-to-ship uh, -ship oil transfers first appeared on my radar in 2006-07 uh, when Melbourne Marine Services proposed to introduce ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers approximately 3.4 nautical miles southeast of Methyl in the Firth of Forth. At that time, the communities around the Fourth Coastline and the Scottish Parliament both took strong stances opposing the oil transfers, 
given the negative environmental impacts they would have on marine life in and around the Forth. Such a strong stance resulted in Melbourne Marine Services aborting their attempt. Given that earlier success, I would therefore encourage colleagues in this place and the Scottish Government to take similar action now to ensure the necessary power is in place for environmental protection of our seas, protection of the tourism industry, and that there is an independent check and balance on the operation of our trust ports. My constituency of Falkirk East is home to some of the first of force most environmentally sensitive shorelines around Bowness, Grangemouth and Earth. So my concern from a constituency point of view is that should ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers be allowed in the Murray Firth, there is no guarantee discussions about conducting these oil transfers in the Forth would not be renewed. Ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers have extremely negative impacts on the environment, as we've already heard in these areas through the emission of carcinogenic volatile organic compound and the possibility of an oil spill with the possibility of approximately two tonnes of oil spilling every second is, that doesn't bear thinking about. The negative impacts of ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers could result in catastrophic, catastrophic destruction for the local marine life, such as the protected bottlenose dolphins in the Murray Firth and more. Additionally, given the geographic layout of the Murray Firth, there is not proper infrastructure for a disaster relief port authority team. Rather, the site for the ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers is just a kilometre from a rocky coastline that Greg Fullerton refers to as a disaster waiting to happen. When the Cromedy Firth Port Authority submitted an application to the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency for a licence for ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers, there was no strategic environmental assessment conducted. This means there has been no consideration of the special protection for birds and bottlenose dolphins in this area, whose environment would be negatively affected, if not entirely destroyed, by an oil transfer spillage. Of course, the Scottish Parliament would better be able to protect the environment in these areas if we were given the devolved powers over the licence application for ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers, as we have been requesting since 2014. Instead, the Scottish Government, Marine Scotland and SEPA are left with only the power to protect the environment to the best of their abilities in the wake of Westminster's ill-considered decision. I would also urge the Scottish Government to consider implementing an independent oversight of the Cromarty Port Authority to ensure the local community and port stakeholders are given better representation and transparency, as there is a concern out there that trust ports are policing themselves. So as it stands, and as, as I understand it, uh, 27 Highlands and Islands Community Councils, 7 NGOs and 100,000 community members have signed a petition against the ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers in the Murray Firth, yet the Cromarty Port Authority seems to have paid no attention. Uh, I realise I'm running out of time, uh, presiding officers, but it's, if I could just quickly say, it's worth noting that the Port Authority receives its funding and is owned by private companies, an issue that's highlighted by the fact that the Cromarty Firth Port Authority has refused to attend public meetings, as I understand it, and have only been to one privately held meeting where meeting minutes were not allowed to be recorded. As John Finney's already mentioned, ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers in the Murray Firth would bring no new jobs to the Cromarty com community, only environmental risks and uncertainty. So I would urge the Scottish Government not to support the licence application and to take every step it can to protect the Murray Firth marine life. I would also urge the Scottish Government to once again request that the UK Government considers providing Scotland and this devolved, with this devolved power so we can control the environmental impacts in our own country rather than just react to them. Thank you. Well, I feel I'm getting taken terrible advantage of here. Thankfully, it's been cross-party. Can we try and pull it back a wee bit? Claudia Beamish, uh, followed by Kate Forbes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to start by thanking John Finney for bringing this issue to the Scottish Parliament and for his informative speech. Our coastal and marine environments are globally renowned for their dramatic beauty. Marine tourism is an expanding sector, which uh, John Finney has highlighted the the local facts about, and I want to highlight a few national ones for Scotland wide. It's fantastic Scotland is able to offer a plethora of options, attracting nature lovers, thrill seekers, families, and those who simply want to relax. The sector is valued Scotland wide at £360 million in 2014, a huge boon for coastal communities and economies, especially in the Highlands and Islands. Whatever floats your boat in marine tourism sector, a clean and diverse marine environment is the linchpin. Nature-based tourism contributes £127 million a year, but any marine activity would be damaged by a diminished environment, whatever its source. The Cromarty and Murray Firths are, as we've heard, areas of environmental significance, 
Both play host to a number of protected seabirds, such as shags and grebes, also to grey seals and harbour porpoises, and a pod of bottlenose dolphins are a favourite for visitors and residents of the Murray Firth. In fact, the two firths are special places for wildlife, and they fall under a number of environmental protection designations, designated as EU Natura 2000 Special Sites of Conservation, Special Protection Areas, and the Cromarty Firth is a site of a special scientific interest for intertidal mud and sand flats. Ongoing research highlights some of the areas that are significant for blue carbon, which I know the Minister and myself have been pushing for through the um, climate change plan. Already, these unique areas are under pressure from the effects of our changing climate and other recognised threats to marine um, ecosystems. In my view, the additional risk of ship-to-ship -ship transfer needs very careful assessment indeed. Even a small accidental oil spill could have a devastating impact on these habitats and it would undo the climate mitigation uh, progress of blue carbon as well. This debate is a valuable way of highlighting the range of concerns and some opposing community views. Cromarty Rising has worked hard, as we've heard, in defence of these habitats and the campaign has the support of 27 um, community councils and the testament of the journey that people have made today also speaks volumes. Not only is there the petition um, to the UK Secretary of State for Transport, is, is, is there a listening ear there? There's also, of course, a petition before our own Parliament. And these community groups feel that they have not been consulted, that questions surrounding the proposal remain unanswered. They highlight the insufficient assessment of the Firth's biodiversity, habitats and people in relation to spills, volatile organic compounds and the, and the economic impact. While the licences for these transfers remain reserved, we rely on the Secretary of State to consider the environmental impacts and not to proceed if there, if there are these adverse impacts. RSP, RSPB Scotland have highlighted to me that in their view, the Cromarty Firth Port Authority's uh, proposal fails to meet the Habitats Directive tests, which are uh, statutory. Uh, as, as there is insufficient information available to enable the decision to be taken and to ensure the integrity of wildlife sites. I'm also, uh, I also understand that the Port Authority has, they argue, worked to address issues of concern um, and that there are concerns um, from them and some local residents um, in the locality um, that the Port Authority should be considered uh, for the local economy. But this does not detract from the fact that the decision, although it is of course reserved, um, must be fully assessed and it hasn't been fully assessed yet. So under a new application, it must be fully assessed. It's interesting that John Finney has also highlighted, um, which I didn't know until his speech, that the Port Authority is working with NIG to see whether there's a possibility of a jetty um, transfer, which would make much more sense um, and give better protection. Um, my own view is that this application, if resubmitted, would be a risk too far. Thank you very much. Well, with a mixture of people speaking for too long and my forgetting to set the clock for Miss Beamish. Yeah, it's fine, Miss Beamish. <laughs> when speaking. My apologies <laughs> for that. <laughs> Therefore, I'm minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. And may I ask John Finney to move such a motion? Moved. Okay. The question is, are we agreed to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes? Thank you. Therefore, we shall. That is agreed. And I call Kate Forbes to be followed by Liam Kerr. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank John Finney too for securing this important debate today. So I support many of my constituents on the Black Isle, many of whom are in the gallery today, and seek to represent their concerns in opposing ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers in the Murray and Cromarty Firths. This is an area of key significance with rich wildlife and a marine environment. Indeed, it's an EU-designated area for bottlenose dolphins. And villages like Cromarty, at the end of the road, as it were, on the Black Isle, rely on tourism, particularly ecotourism. It's a place that draws in visitors and residents alike because of the riches and the wealth of the natural environment. And so, 
As Marie Todd highlighted, there is one big question at the heart of this debate, and that is why. Why risk it? Are there really any benefits worth those significant risks of allowing ship-to-ship -ship transfers in the Murray and Cromarty Firths? Although I did not don a dolphin costume, I was pleased to join the Cromarty Rising rally outside Parliament in January. And I was also pleased to support the group as they submitted their petition, Ship to Ship Oil Transfers and Trust Port Accountability to the Public Petitions Committee in March. It's clear that this is a complex subject and the expertise amongst those in Cromarty Rising has really helped to bring this to the fore and raise the profile of this issue. Many legitimate issues have been raised. The Public Petitions Committee have written to the Scottish Government and other relevant stakeholders like Marine Scotland and I look forward to reading their responses to the petitioners' pertinent questions and hope some answers will be given when the committee picks up the petition again later this month. It's clear that the initial application did not meet the standards expected and there is no current application. John Finney has already alluded to it but there was a mathematical conundrum at the heart of the application. When Briggs Marine, a reputable and respected marine services company, conducted an assessment of another ship-to-ship -ship proposal in another part of Scotland, they stated that the maximum oil spill would be the ship's entire load. And for the Murray and Cromarty Firths, we're talking 180,000 tonnes of crude oil. However, at the stroke of a pen, that figure was reduced to one tonne in the application. There's no, that's no doubt partly what prompted the First Minister to say a few months ago that on the basis of the evidence so far, the Scottish Government was unconvinced that ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers could or should take place without causing risk to the environment, particularly to dolph bottlenose dolphins. She continued, and I quote, the Scottish Government hears the concerns of those communities and will do anything we can to make sure they are heard by the Marine Coast Guard Agency while campaigning for the issue to be devolved. So can I finish with a word of... Yes. John Finney. Right, no, sir, I, I'm grateful for the member taking intervention. She'll be aware of the concerns of her constituents about the, the unexploded munitions recently washed up at, at Rose Markey there. I understand that, 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 that given its naval background that that is the case at the, uh, the anchorage point, the proposed anchorage point. Does she share my concerns that that, at the very least, should be part of the assessment and a formal, um, formally done by the appropriate people? Kate Forbes. Yes, um, I, would, I understand where um, John Finney is coming from. I'm aware of these issues. And I think the key in all of this is that all facts need to be on the table when looking at these issues and nothing should be sneaked through without proper consultation. And proper consultation with the Scottish Government means a proper formal consultation in terms of asking for the Scottish Government's view on all of these issues in an effort to enable what Nicola Sturgeon clearly asks for in terms of... Um, uh, the, the issues and concerns of local communities being listened to by the Marine Coast Guard Agency. So can I just finish with a, a word of advice to any prospective developers out there? And it's a principle that can equally apply to other planning applications, be it in the middle of the water or on dry land. And as the MSP for Sky Lechaber and Badenoch, I'm passionate about small highland communities having a voice when it comes to decisions being taken on their doorsteps and Cromarty Rising have certainly made their voice heard loud and clear. It is incredible that over 100,000 people, and the number keeps rising, have signed a petition on the 38 Degrees website. And whatever the issue and whatever the outcome, developers, planners, decision makers must not neglect to engage with local communities and listen. So, presiding officer, I'm not against ship-to-ship -ship transfers per se, but in the right place with the right scientific evidence. And on both counts, I feel that the application, the former application for the Cromarty and Murray Firths, has not met the high standards that we should impose on any development in an area of national environmental importance. Thank you. I call Liam Kerr to be followed by Gail Ross. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I thank John Finney for securing this topical and important debate. On average, 20 ship-to-ship -ship oil transfer operations occur at various places around the world each day. In Scotland, they take place at Scapa Flow in Orkney, Nig in the Cromarty Firth and Solemvo in Shetland, and have done for many years. The port of Cromarty Firth applied for a license to do such transfers in five new locations within the harbour area. And a group called Cromarty Rising presented public petition PE01637 with over 100,000 signatures from people across the region and the world to Chris Grayling opposing the application. And like others, I welcome them to this chamber 
And as the motion and indeed Kate Forbes just said, getting so many signatures is an extraordinary achievement. The motion today also suggests the locations are completely unsuitable for such operations. Now, of course, that's predicated on an environmental analysis in which something goes wrong, because logistically the locations may well be suitable, although I note the withdrawn proposals showed the sea was quite shallow at the proposed anchorages and the suitability for bigger ships, which would presumably be the only ones that make it viable, has to be questionable. I also note there's a war grave uh, under the proposed site, which I think John Finney was, Finney was alluding to in his intervention. Now, since the 1980s, the Port of Cromarty Firth has been involved in the safe handling of oil tankers, with an estimated 250 ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers being made there. That is 175 million barrels of oil equivalent, safely transferred into tankers and shipped to global markets. So it's not new technology, it's not new processes, but it is good for the economy. However, accidents can occur, and we must consider what would happen if ships were to collide during transfer, the impact of any ballast water being discharged, and any potential oil spills. The Brayer incident in 1993, which was alluded to earlier, and the two Solemn Vaux spills in 2009 show it can happen. Now, following the Brayer incident, a UK government inquiry made a number of key recommendations aimed at improving safety and minimising pollution, the thrust of which were subsequently adopted. Then the merchant shipping, ship to ship transfers regulations were introduced to ensure that transfers are carefully monitored and well regulated. These were supported by a number of significant NGOs, including RSPB Scotland, Whale and Dolphin Conservation, the Hebridean Whale, Hebridean Whale and Dolphin Trust, and the Marine Conservation Society. Robust operational procedures and mitigation measures are also in place to help prevent accidental spills during ship to ship transfers including checking weather conditions, carrying out safety checklists of all equipment, pre-meetings with the relevant parties to agree a transfer plan, use of a qualified STS superintendent to oversee the transfer, and transfer between ships undertaken using industry standard certified hoses. And only when all procedures have been followed does a transfer take place. In the unlikely event of an oil spill, an oil spill contingency plan, which was approved by the MCA, is in place, which mitigates against environmental impact. And according to the International Maritime Organization, ship-to-ship -ship transfers are low risk and can be carried out safely where due regard is given to the various regulations. However, the Cromarty and Murray Firths are a beautiful and vital part of Scotland. And I accept the motion's reference to environmental significance. They are home to rare species and habitats and particularly in relation uh, to tourism are an extremely valuable part of the Scottish economy, none of which must be adversely impacted by any actions, including ship-to-ship -ship transfers. Deputy Presiding Officer, if another licence application is submitted, the views and concerns of stakeholders and local residents must be valued and a full consultation with communities take place. It is imperative that there is full uh, involvement from the MCA and SEPA so that we can strike the right balance between economic growth and job creation for the Highlands, whilst maintaining the highest standards of environmental protection and sustainability. Thank you. I call Gail Ross to be followed by the last of our open debate <coughs> speakers. It will be Mark Ruskell. Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. I would also like to welcome and pay tribute to the people in the gallery who have travelled such a long way, including some of my former colleagues from Highland Council, and those watching at home for a focused and passionate campaign, thank you for all your correspondence and information. I would also like to thank John Finney for bringing this debate to the Scottish Parliament. Presiding Officer, after so many speakers, I don't need to go into why we are here, because we know why. It has been said that ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers happen every day, perfectly safely, all over the world. This we know, and this is not in dispute. Ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers in an area of such high environmental significance, however, are extremely controversial, and this prospective application has raised concerns among the communities on all sides of the Firth, and that is the focus of today's motion. Oil transfers, as has been said, have been carried out in the Cromarty Firth for a number of years, but at the relative safely of the Nig Jetty. With ships tied up, unfortunately, this is no longer feasible. But I also got the email to say that the Port of Cromarty Firth um, are exploring this option further, and this is to be welcomed. 
The difference with this operation that is being proposed is that there would be a transfer of crude oil in open waters with ships at anchor close to the shore and right on the breeding ground of a pod of bottlenose dolphins in an area of significant environmental importance. This area of my constituency holds a hugely valuable ecosystem and I can't impress enough how important this environment is to the local community, its significance in the marine science world and to Scotland, not just the local economy, but to Scotland as a tourist destination. In December, hundreds of people gathered on the beach at Nairn to protest at the plans and 27 community councils from all around the Firth have opposed it. Businesses, residents and organisations have all voiced their concerns about this application, proposed application, and currently feel that they are not being listened to, despite the port insisting it is listening, consulting and engaging. President Officer, the Port of Cromarty Firth have to take on board all of the concerns from the community, from the RSPB, from the whale and dolphin conservation. And it's not just about an oil spill. The Scottish Wildlife Trust, SNH and SEPA have raised concerns about biosecurity, ballast discharge, recovery of beached oil, tidal flows, and the Association for the Protection of Rural Scotland are also worried about the environment and tourism. All of these organisations are concerned about the contingency measures and the consequences of spills or fumes harming the fragile ecosystem of the area. I don't want to see cetaceans being euthanised because of an accidental spill. It would be devastating. As it stands currently, we await the new application to see how, or indeed if, it addresses the concerns of the communities. And I feel very strongly that the port and the community have to work together on this. There has to be an appropriate assessment under the European Environment and Habitats Directive. This is a vital part of the application that was lacking first time around. Presiding officer, in conclusion, and with your permission, I quote from a letter sent in reply to the letter Kate Forbes and I sent to the Department for Transport in January, which clearly states that the Scottish Government will be informed of the final decision before it is made public. It is a reserve matter. It is a decision to be made by the MCA and the UK Government, but I fully support the call for the Scottish Government to have the full powers of devolution over all oil at sea transfer licences, which, as I said, remains a reserve matter. We need this power and we need it now. Thank you. I call Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I thank my colleague John Finney for bringing forward this important topic for debate here tonight. It certainly brings back memories from 2006 when we had the first ship-to-ship -ship oil transfer members debate in this chamber, brought forward by Robin Harper. There are, of course, some differences and some similarities between the issues and also the members. But certainly at that time, ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers were the biggest environmental threat facing Scotland, with communities on every side of the Forth rising up against the threat to their environment and their livelihoods. But it wasn't just communities around the Forth who voiced concerns. Communities around Scotland, including, ironically, those around the Murray Firth, recognised the Forth proposal as a Trojan horse for a surge in oil transfers in open water around our coasts. There was the concern about harbour authorities with deep conflicts of interest between their profit-making desires and their environmental duties. There was confusion about the fuzzy boundary between Westminster and Holyrood powers. And there was frustration by a lack of action from the then Scottish executive when they had clear devolved responsibilities to defend our precious environment. So the question is, presiding officer, what exactly has changed since then? It seems very little. The Smith Commission failed to resolve the Scottish Parliament's clear devolved powers on the environment with those reserved on marine transport. So the fuzzy boundary remains. And we still have no planned approach across the British Isles as to where it is appropriate, if anywhere, to carry out these transfers in open water rather than in the protected confines of a harbour. Meanwhile, the failure of the Westminster government to even consult the Scottish government on the live review of the ship-to-ship -ship oil transfer regulations makes an absolute mockery of the shared governance arrangements that we have. But who knows? Maybe the Secretary of State for Transport took Marine Scotland out of his, his address book and they failed to respond to the original license application for the Cromarty transfers in 2015. A grave error, in my view. 
What is clear is that under any constitutional settlement we could think of in this chamber, there has to be a better way to manage our shared seas, the economic opportunities and the environmental responsibilities that come with it. In response to the fourth debacle, the fresh Scottish Government under Environment Minister Richard Lockhead in 2007, who I don't think is here at this debate tonight, amended the regulations to ensure that ministers were able to direct competent authorities to properly assess the wide-ranging risks to protected habitats. Now, this law change, for those who can remember it, was much heralded by the Scottish Government at the time. But now, when I ask a written question on the use of these beefed-up powers, the answer is that they can't use them. So why bring them in in the first place? Especially under the argument at the time that this change would be used to get a grip on an ambitious oil transfer industry. I wonder now what other powers are apparently redundant, Minister. Is it the case that whenever a dolphin protected under EU law is going to be disturbed by oil transfers, then the Scottish Government is no longer required to sanction this? Are we retreating from our hard-won protections for nature? There are many questions still to be answered especially around the role of SNH. And I wish the Petitions Committee well in exploring them and hope that the current petition will be passed on to the Environment Committee for further forensic examination. In concluding, Presiding Officer, Cromarty Rising and their community should be applauded. They are Scotland's standing rock. And we in this Parliament must now rise to their challenge and find a way to protect our environment. Otherwise, we will go back to square one again in this chamber in another decade. I call Paul Wheelhouse to respond to this debate. Uh, around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and I, I thank John Finney for bringing the question of ship-to-ship -ship transfers to the debating chamber and providing uh, me with the opportunity myself to congratulate uh, Cromarty Rising, as he did, for getting over 100,000 signatures on their petition uh, to the Secretary of State for Transport, a significant achievement in its own right, and I agree with members who've highlighted that point. I take to heart the very real concern of communities who live around the Murray and uh, Cromarty Firth over the application from the Cromarty Firth Port Authority uh, to undertake ship-to-ship -ship transfers of crude oil at sea in the inner Murray Firth. Uh, I think the point has been made by a number of members. The issue at stake is around the, not the ship-to-ship -ship transfers themselves, but the manner in which they are being proposed to be done uh, in open waters, which has raised concerns with a number of members across the chamber. But as both John Finney and Kate Forbes have stated, the First Minister made our position uh, clear on the 12th of January, and this has not changed. Based on the current information, we remain unconvinced that ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers can, or indeed should, take place at anchor in the Inner Murray Firth without an unacceptable risk to the marine environment, in particular to the special area of conservation for bottlenose dolphins. But I have to make absolutely clear, for it is something that does need to be made clear, uh, and I'm pleased that a number of members have highlighted this, that the Scottish Government has no powers over the decision-making process for any application for oil transfer licences, and I'll try and set out uh, some of the background to that. The regulations under which such applications are considered is a matter uh, currently uh, reserved to the Secretary of State for Transport. Uh, as Angus Macdonald set out in 2007, uh, there were concerns over the risk to the environment from a similar plan in the Firth of Forth. At that point in time, the regulatory regime for ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers was lacking in its entirety. As a consequence of our action, uh, the UK government implemented the Merchant Shipping Ship-to-Ship uh, -ship Transfers regulations in 2010. The introduction of these new regulations put in place a process designed to ensure that the consideration of future applications would be publicly accountable. It also created provisions to ensure compliance with environmental impact assessment requirements and the EU Habitats Directive. And whilst we pressed for action and succeeded in getting better regulation of the activity, the UK government failed to devolve responsibility for Scottish territorial waters to the Scottish government. So to be absolutely clear, uh, presiding officer, the regulations currently do not provide any formal role for Scottish ministers in this matter, even for applications in our own waters. And we are not even recognised as a consultation body as per section two of the 2010 Act. The minister I, I will. John Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm grateful for the Minister accepting intervention. Would you care to comment on my analogy about um, nuclear power stations, Minister? And are you saying there is absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing, that SIPA, SNH and Marine Scotland, the Marine Plan has no relevance to any of this? Is that, is that the position? Because that's, that, that's a dereliction of duty, as I would see things. 
Uh, Paul, no, I, has... I, I think uh, I take the point that, that Mr Finney is making, but uh, in the case of uh, whether there's planning consent for new nuclear power stations, the Scottish Government, ultimately the local authority and Scottish Government are the planning authority in that respect. In this uh, respect, in terms of the uh, role that uh, the Scottish Government has in this process, we do not have planning powers in relation to this particular case, and it's the, the uh, MCA itself which does. But I'm going to explain a little bit more about our, our approach to this, and hopefully that will be helpful to Mr, Mr. Finney. Um, as, I, as I say, the decision whether to issue a ship-to-ship -ship oil transfer licence in the Scottish territorial waters is currently reserved to Secretary of State for Transport, as many members have acknowledged under the terms of the Act. And the Scottish Government will, of course, continue to press the UK Government for devolution of this important function for Scottish waters. That broader consideration of whether the function should be devolved doesn't revolve, uh, resolve the current issue in the Murray Firth, of course. However, there are some things that can be done to ensure that the Secretary of State for Transport is held uh, fully to account in the decision-making process. First, we can insist that the Secretary of State for Transport take full account of the statutory advice given by Scottish Natural Heritage, who are the only Scottish body currently recognised by the regulations. I am aware that the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency has also provided advice, and I would hope that that should also be taken into account by the Secretary of State for Transport. Secondly, and importantly, we can continue to press the Secretary of State for Transport to, at the very least, formally invite the Scottish Government to respond to a revised application. That would enable us to provide our view regarding the extent to which relevant environmental legislation has been complied with. Thirdly, we can call upon the Secretary of State for Transport to listen to the concerns raised in the petition, as well as to the heartfelt protests of the local people represented here today in the gallery who have been making their opposition known both here and on the beaches of the Murray Firth. It has also become apparent that the Secretary of State for Transport has recently undertaken a light touch review of the regulations. Uh, I'm sorry to say remarkably, given the well-documented interest in such matters on the part of the Scottish Government, again, uh, they did not think it necessary to inform or even consult the Scottish Government in that review. Needless to say, we are very disappointed at uh, that uh, mystifying uh, omission by the Secretary of State for Transport, and our feelings on this matter have been made absolutely clear to him, and I stress that. I will indeed. Gail Ross. Thank you. Um, can you outline if the local authorities have any say in this uh, proposed application? Paul Hill has. Uh, as far as I'm aware, the, the only formal uh, consultation body in relation to the legislation as it stands is uh, SNH. Um, but clearly, uh, local authorities will have expressed a view, I'm sure, in regard to the, to the proposals. And again, I would hope that uh, the, the Secretary of State will take on board legitimate views of local stakeholders. But with regard to the governance of trust ports, which has come up, the trust port model is held in high regard by ministers, the industry and members of this parliament. That support was clearly demonstrated through the approval of the Aberdeen Harbour Revision Order and the Harbour Scotland Act 2015. Trust ports are statutory bodies in their own right and their constitution requires them to ensure that the harbour facilities are fit for purpose and are secured for future generations. There are no shareholders and any profits made must be returned to the harbour for this purpose. This does mean that trust ports are operating within a commercial and often competitive environment and it is for their boards to ensure they operate effectively in this way, but also ensuring they are complying with the powers set out in the legislation. Although there are no shareholders, there are a wide range of stakeholders and we expect uh, trust ports to take their views into account. These stakeholders will vary from port to port, but will certainly include the port users, the local authority and the local communities. I have made uh, clear that regrettably the responsibility for this reserved matter rests with the Secretary of State for Transport, not Scottish ministers. We will, however, I assure members, continue to make best efforts to ensure the Secretary of State for Transport is held to account in a decision-making process, and I suggest that all stakeholders do exactly the same. I will ensure that any Scottish Government response to a future application highlights the need to comply with environmental legislation and echoes the concerns, the many concerns raised today uh, by uh, members across the Chamber and the concerns raised by Scottish Natural Heritage and local communities. And I trust that the Secretary of State for Transport will listen and determine the matter for the good of Scotland, its vibrant coastal communities and the precious marine environment we all rely on. And members in the chamber could not have been clearer about the importance of uh, wildlife tourism to the local economy 
uh, clearly concerns around uh, SSSIs, as Claudia Beamish has set out, and concerns around uh, the issues about potentially creating a precedent for other uh, estuaries around the, uh, the, the coast of Scotland, including the Firth of Forth, as raised by my colleague Angus Macdonald. So I hope that the Secretary of State listens to the points that have been raised today uh, by members across the Chamber from all parties and uh, thinks very carefully about the application when it is sub subsequently submitted. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Thank you.